Dawn comes a solitude that isn't really mine. Guide me to a site where painters can create the picture of their perfect life. Cause I've been behind my mind, forgetting that we're all alive. Well, sometimes we need to give without gaining this. beautiful for me to listen to music that opens me. Uh, so much music I find now, the more open I become, I feel I can feel the emotions of where they want to shut down and I, it's beautiful. I, I reckon on the planet we haven't really harnessed the power of music yet, you know, to open us. Mm. Up in Queensland there's a whole group of people now with the God's Way of Love. Uh, they've formed a team called the Arts Team and they're all about using art in that way, you know, to open us and express about God. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. 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 yeah we, we bought them a sound system actually just a few weeks ago now. So they've got their own sound system so they can do gigs and whatever else as well. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking forward to hearing a few gigs from the, from the team. So what do we want to talk about tonight? Uh, what do you want to talk about tonight? Yeah. Uh, in the mic, if we, have, if we hand the mic. Yeah. Igor, is that on? Yep, sorry, I just stood right in front of it. <laughs> you got my chest. Um, I was here on Saturday. Yep. And I put my hand up to ask a question about spirits. Yep. And we ran out of time. Yeah. We got in the car, my iPod had obviously been running all day. And it started on a talk about spirit relationships. And I froze the whole way home. Yeah. I was shaking in the car. Yeah. And the whole thing petrifies me to death. I've had nightmares, I think, since birth, as far as back as I can remember. Yeah. Fairly dark ones. And, you know, wake up the whole house kind of ones. And... Um, were you being chased and violent? And no. No? Uh, funnily enough, no. Just the presence of a male coming up the stairs towards my bedroom was enough. Yeah. And I've had a couple of realisations this week. And one was when I first moved out of home, um, I would walk into my flat and I would be flung into my room and thrown around the room. Yeah. It was how, like how old were you then? Of independence, early 20s. Yeah. Then even though I'm still married, I went back to my maiden name and those dreams started to happen again. And ever since I've started on this path, mm -hmm. I have been flung around my house so much in my dreams. And then on Saturday night, 
I've never been treated with such anger in a dream and the whole thing petrifies me. Yeah, yeah. And now they've started to attack my husband in my dream. My husband was choking and I'm scared to death. Yeah. But this is all happening in your dreams? Yep. Yep. And I woke up because my husband was choking and I just woke up scared to death that if I continue down this path, they're going to start to attack my family. Mm-hmm. Because I've got a 12-year-old son who also has very dark nightmares, so he's obviously getting that from me. Yeah. And then I feel guilty and I don't know how to change that. Yeah. I'm just petrified. So what is the question? I don't know what to do about it. Okay. Like I've had nightmares my whole life. I just don't know how to change that. Um, There's quite a bit in your question, but I'd love to answer it all for you. Sound all right? Okay. You all right? (laughs) Yep. Here's you, and in your childhood, obviously, um, your parents, which I'll draw like so, had huge amounts of fears um, that they denied, suppressed. Okay? In the process, what that does is it creates, as I mentioned to, on the weekend, here's your, if you could say, your protective shell that's around you, which is, a, which is basically created by your emotional state. So the more your emotional state is in a state of pure love, the more of a protective shell you have right array around you. But remember we said uh, the, 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 the rubber? What happens is we start, as we, really, as we have different emotions, we have different holes in that aura that allow then, that are sort of like vortexes that go into different parts of our both our spirit body and our physical body. So your parents, because of their emotional injuries, allowed this state in you, basically. Because a a child comes under the protective barriers of their parents. Now, because of that, from that moment on, that leaves you open to the same fears that your parents have. So if your parents are afraid of spirits, then... Uh, you now are open to being afraid of spirits and then to have spirits terrify you through that opening. Now, all of the things that you've mentioned, though, are fears. The things that happen in our dreams, and this is an important thing to remember about dreams, dreams consist of, and we've talked about this before, but dreams consist of two things. Right? The first thing is real life, sleep state, sorry about this, sleep state, experiences. Thank you. So that's the first thing, real life, sleep state, experiences. So the the issue you have is, is what's happening to you a real life sleep sleep state experience or not? Now when I say a sleep state experience, every single one of us, as soon as we go to sleep, separates from our physical body And our physical body lays there on our bed, resting. And our spirit body is actually in the state where it's now in the spirit world and able to have interactions. It it can also travel back and forward between the spirit world and the earth in the sleep state. So you can actually look at other places on the earth even and visit other people on the earth who who are also in the sleep state. Or you can visit people in the spirit world in the sleep state, but only to the point of your condition. So if your condition is, say, in a first fear, quite a fearful condition, then you'll only visit the first fear in your sleep state. If your condition is about, uh, released a lot of emotions and you've, and you've got closer to God, you've received divine love, and your, and your condition is, uh, say, in a third sphere condition, then you can go anywhere from the third sphere down to the second sphere or the first sphere in your sleep state. So that's the first thing. Is, this, is what's been happening to you a sleep state experience is the first question. And then the second thing is that it's the, the other reason for dreams is the denial of emotion in the awake state.
Maybe I thought I was going to be free by moving and I wasn't. <coughs> you thought you were going to Maybe be... Maybe I thought I was free by moving out and I wasn't. <coughs> well, the problem that you're facing and have faced most of your life is that you deny your fears as much as possible in the awake state. Now that denial, this denial is going to create an attraction of having everything that you deny in your awake state reflected in your dream. So if in my awake state I'm really quite terrified but I deny that I'm having any fear at all, then what, I, what will happen as soon as I go to sleep is all of... The, the way the law of attraction works is that all of the things that I'm denying in my wake state start coming up in my sleep as dreams. So all the things I'm afraid of in normal day-to-day -day life that I'm trying to suppress, I will now automatically attract in my dream state. Does that make sense? So what's happening for yourself, uh, something that's been happening for a long, long time now, is that you have had spirit influence around you particularly in your sleep state most of the spirit influence is masculine males who are violent right? yeah but they are, they are actually males who that you're afraid of in your awake state right? and one of the reasons why you've used anger a lot with males in the past is you it's a way of preventing your fear from being exposed towards those males your fear of them right so because of your fears, you're now going to attract dreams, fears that you're denying in your awake state, you're going to attract dreams due to the denial of the awake state emotion in which the same fears that you're actually afraid of in your awake state are now going to per permeate your dream. And so you're just going to have dream after dream after dream after dream after dream saying, and, it, and in a way it's your own soul saying to yourself, you need to deal with this, you need to deal with this, you need to deal with this, you're not dealing with this, you're not dealing with this again. <laughs> like just reminding you over and over again. Now, because it's fear, and most people believe that they ha can't handle fear, they don't see fear as an emotion. They see fear as a reality. Remember fears we often see as false expectations appearing real to us, right? So we actually believe that all of our fears are real, but they're not. But while we believe they're real, any spirit can threaten us with them and have a large degree of power over us as a result. Does that make sense? So if I know that you are afraid of a certain thing happening, all I need to do is threaten you with that happening and you'll automatically stop doing the things that you want to do and automatically start doing what I, the spirit, wants you to do. Does that make sense? So these spirits can also, because of your denial of your emotions in your awake state, influence your dreams in such a way that you are terrified every night that you go to sleep. Yes. And so what do you do? You stay up late at night, right? And, and then, you know, it might be even late into the evening where you even get to sleep. And then if you do prefer to sleep, you prefer to sleep during the day sometime. But you can't even do that now. Use it if you can use don't do that either now. No. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can't even sleep during the day anymore easily. And it, it's because you're terrified now of your dreams. But the reality is that actually your dreams are being created by your denial of your emotion in your awake state anyway. So if you started to address the emotions that you have in your wake state, which is a terrify, you're terrified of what spirits or violent men will do to you or to your family, and you allow yourself to embrace that fear as a fear and actually feel it, you'll find you will stop having those dreams altogether and you'll have a peaceful night's sleep. But on top of that, you'll have dealt with the fear in your awake state. So it's not, it means that spirits won't be able to manipulate you in your awake state in order to avoid your fears. Does that make sense? I think what freaked me out on Saturday is that my sister spoke to you both on Saturday and you said that you felt you haven't been feeling great because you have felt like you've been influenced by spirits lately. Yep. Is that, that, mm -hmm. Have I got that right? Yep. Sort of. Uh, uh, attack we're rather under a lot than of, influence. We're under yep. a lot attack. of spirit attack. Yep. yep. And I think if you in your state can feel attacked, and feel, whether it be run down or tired or whatever it is that you feel, 
I feel like what hope have I got? Well, let, well, let's get it in context, shall we? Yeah. From the moment that myself and Mary reincarnated, there were a whole millions and millions of spirits in the spirit world who knew we were, who we were and wanted us to die. So for the majority of our life, we've been attacked heavily, far more than the average person on earth would get, ever get attacked by spirits. And now, there is, there is now four groups of spirits who now in the spirit world know who we are. And that's uh, the, the spirits who do with politi the politics on the planet, the spirits that do with the economics on the planet, the spirits to do with the religions on the planet, and the spirits to do with the women-based issues on the planet. And every one of those groups of spirits don't want myself or Mary to survive. Now, you are not ever going to come under that kind of attack. Do you, do you follow me? So the, the reality is the attack that myself and Mary are under is quite extreme in comparison, where we have sometimes billions of spirits attacking us at any one point in time, whereas you might have at any one point in time five or ten spirits attacking you if you're in a lot of fear. Does that make sense? And the only way they can attack us anyway is through our emotional holes, which is exactly the same as yourself. And so myself and Mary are just focusing on pat patching up our emotional holes. Does that make sense? But, I, yeah. but it does require that we feel our terror and our fear, yeah. just like what we're saying to you. Yeah. So don't go and get, don't think just because myself and Mary are under attack, it means it's going to be worse for you. It's actually going to be easier. No, I don't feel like it's going to be easier. worse for me at all, but I just... <laughs> um, but can you understand what's going on? So the key thing then is to look at your fear of your fear. So do Remember, I need to say that again? <laughs> just, just and that's where you scary. that's where you go wrong straight away. As soon as you say that to yourself. You've discounted any help God can give you. You've discounted that God is actually more powerful than any spirit who surrounds you. And that love is also more powerful than any spirit that surrounds you. And you've also disempowered yourself by saying, I can't cope with the emotion of fear. And actually God created you that you actually can cope with the emotion of fear. But, but your outlook about the fear needs to change. Does that make sense? At the moment, your outlook about the fear is that fear is something that I'm horrified and terrified of. I can't deal with. I must stay away from. Yeah? That's how you feel. So feel that emotion. Allow yourself to feel that emotion. The fact that you feel that fear is too hard. And pray about that emotion. Don't worry about all the others. Just focus on praying about that emotion, the fear-based emotion. When you get to the point where you can see fear as just another emotion, you will find you will allow yourself to feel it. And from that moment on, no spirit will bother you because they can't. They can't influence you through your fear anymore. Yep. At the moment, because you're terrified of your fear, spirits can easily manipulate you. It's... How is that? Microphone. The fear of your own fear often feels a lot worse than feeling the actual fear. Um, and, yeah, that's just... Not that's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. The issue for lots of us, <laughs> myself included, is that I've, I've defended my fear as a real thing for most of my life and said, no, it's not just an emotion. It's a, it could happen. It's a reality. And that put up a barrier for me between actually experiencing my fear... And it's still something that I like. I have to remind myself of. And initially, it started as like an intellectual process of going, "Okay, I feel like this fear is completely real, and I cannot like it's going to happen." And so I can't let it go ever. To reminding myself, "Okay, God created me to be able to experience fear, and uh, and being able to soften into that place a, a bit." Yeah. Just covered it with anger. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, your, yeah. your primary method of controlling your fear is to revert to anger or rage. And actually the and anger is a <coughs> method of actually uh, firstly feeling a bit more powerful. But also there's a danger in the anger in that while you're in an angry state, now spirits can manipulate you to do what they want 
and that's where you often finish up doing something that you're not happy about yourself doing in that state. And so if you deal with your fears, now it's impossible to manipulate you to do something you don't really want to do. And also the defence of fear is the major cause of anger. So when we defend our fear, when we're trying to prevent somebody from even talking about our fear, that's when we revert to anger. And it's the defence of the fear that creates the anger, in fact. So if we can learn to not defend our fear, we can then feel our fear and very rarely, if ever, get angry as a result. Ironically, we'll also then be able to feel our fear. As we release our fear in our day-to-day -day life, we will no longer be in denial of it in our day-to-day -day life. So then when we go to sleep, we will no longer be having dreams that relate to our fear. Mary was having quite significant bad dreams, weren't you, for a couple of years Definitely. prior to now? Definitely. Um, and this totally applies to me, Margie. Like, I feel like I've spent two years... Um, I started right up there in addiction and getting angry and I, I would defend my fears to AJ all of the time. Um, and I had terrible, terrible dreams, like constantly. I didn't want to go to sleep. Um, and, and I would try and make myself so tired that I would just pass out. And I could sleep better during the day, as well, like after dawn. So I'd stay up really late and then I'd sleep in beyond dawn because it felt safer. Um, and for me, it's been a process over years of, of recognising um, some truths intellectually, initially, and um, really focusing on my addictions. I just I can't recommend that enough to everyone. It's, going, it's so hard to feel anything near a fear or a causal emotion when you're sitting in addiction. And um, the last probably eight months, I've really, really focused on addiction. And I would say it's only as a result of that, as a result of make, setting my intention to give up the addictions, um, that I've now begun to experience fear and terror. But I, could, I couldn't really skip to it <laughs> because my addictions were showing how resistive I was to it anyway. And most of us live in emotional addiction like 90% of our day. <laughs> yeah. And all of them to avoid a fear of some kind yeah. generally. All addictions are born out of avoidance of fear. So. Yeah. So you know that feeling you had that you're not going to be able to cope, you can't cope with the fear and all those feelings that you're having, they are the feelings you want to focus on the most and pray to God about just helping you through it. Ultimately, our fears all are the result of the fact that we don't believe that God will actually help us and that we don't really trust God very much and those kind of feelings yep. we have. And, and ironically, as we release the fears, we'll actually come to trust God more. So it's sort of like the fear is a way of almost fighting God and saying, look, you're not going to be able to help me. You know, I've got all this fear and you're not going to save me. If somebody comes to hurt me, you're not going to save me. And so what we do is we project all of our fears onto God, which also prevents that relationship as well. The relationship actually that can make us peaceful and calm in the face of any traumatic situation. Uh, yeah, and I was literally just today having a big cry about that. I just feeling like God can't protect me from the evilness that is here in this plane, and um, and that's the like that's what I'm learning more and more about this path. If I just let myself be true to whatever the emotion is, even if it's this hopelessness or desperation or terror, um, and open my heart to God in that moment of feeling it that's when the shifts happen for us. But, but we have to be real about what it is that's there. And so I, I feel... I I don't trust God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is why Saturday's talk was a good one, maybe. Yeah. yeah. In the end, we... Um, obviously, everything myself and Mary are teaching is about coming to have this close relationship with God where you feel God and also trust implicitly everything that God does. And, and that can help your fears remarkably. But unfortunately... Um, if we understand the sort of the dynamic that's occurring, as Mary was just mentioning, I just if we just yeah. rub this bit here off for a sec. So what Mary just said was that, you know, underneath were the oh my, my black's not very good. Yep. Is it? If I if I write down here's my causal grief that I have, so there's and then above that are the fears or as we said the other day terror that we have inside of us. And then above that is our addictions to mask addictions. 
yeah. to mask our fears and terrors, you know, so that they look like they're not really there and we don't have to acknowledge them. And then when our addictions are not met, we have a tendency to go to anger or rage. Right? So you can see that um, every time we decide to stay away from the fear, we're going to have to go to our addictions in order to salve our fears or we're going to have to go to anger in order to suppress them. And the problem with these two states is they get us no, clear, no, no, no closer to God. The only way that we can get closer to God is to go in this direction, so away from our addictions and into our fear. And then once we're through our fear, you'll be away from your fear and into your causal grief, your grieving-based emotions. Yeah. And they are the emotions that get you closer to God. Um, until that time, if you stay in your addictions and your anger... You know, it's like it's still staying a long way away from God. So the irony is we're further away from God by trying to avoid our terror. When we're truthful about our terror with God, from that moment on we're closer to God as but well. But I've tried to be more truthful and on Saturday night my daughter, who is nine, was in tears because she sees me crying a lot. So then I feel guilty. Um, but your daughter is only in tears from you crying because she feels the projection that she has from you, that she has to do something to make your tears go away. When you fully own all of your own grief, your children will not cry at all. In fact, what will happen is your children go, oh, mummy's just dealing with something, I'll go and play quietly or whatever, and they'll just My go... My daughter has said that. Once when I went out and I felt great when I came in, she said to me, have you had a good sook and a cry? And I said, yeah. And it was over. Why is she reverting back now? Like, what, what have I done for her to revert back to crying? It, it's, well, it's the projection you have at her. You want somebody to save you from your fear. Do you not? Not my children. No, but see, the projection coming out of you is, is not as selective as you hope it to be. You see, the projection coming out of me is, save me from my terror... Every single around person around me, and by the way, my children will be the most sensitive to that projection and not the least sensitive, are going to want to then try to save us from our terror. Does that make sense? And in the process of attempting to save us from our terror, they then don't know how to do it. They become all worried and... Does that make sense? They become all worried and... and um, what's the word I'm looking for? The Anxious. phone's interrupting yeah. me. <laughs> Anxious and... and uh, they, they, they feel that um, they are somehow responsible, but they don't know what to do about it. And so, so they get into a state of confusion. Now, the, the key is that um, every single time... You, and this is something to appreciate um, with our emotions. You, you can't selectively control who receives your projections when you are in denial of an emotion. Yeah. So, so he is... If, he, if this is yourself in denial of an emotion, so imagine, here, here's what the emotion should do. It should just pass straight through you, right? And, uh, and you should feel it completely. But when we're in denial of emotion, it's like we've got a great big block and it comes down to that point and then just squirts out everywhere, right? All around our environment, right? Now, you don't have any control over which person receives that projection at all. As soon as, as soon as you're in denial of an emotion, from then on, every single individual in your environment feels it. And it's totally out of your control which one of those individuals is feeling it until you go, I need to feel it. And as soon as you choose to feel it yourself, now not a single person in your environment will need to feel it. And that's the only choice we have. Either we feel it or we don't. If we don't feel it, every single person in our environment is going to get the barrage of it at some point. And, and your children are the most sensitive people in your environment, so obviously they're going to pick it up the first. And it's lovely that you don't want to harm your children, so choose instead to have the courage to feel the fear. Is that... Yeah. And that is a choice that has to, like Mary mentioned, has to be made for yourself. Nobody else can do that for you. And, and to be frank, nobody can s secure you through it, you know, keep you safe through it, because by definition, to feel fear, you're going to have to feel unsafe. 
And this is what most of us don't want to do. We don't want to feel unsafe and so we deny the fear and in the process of denying the fear we're carrying it around with us being manipulated by spirits and usually also ourselves manipulating other people uh, through our fear and terror. And the irony is as soon as we choose to feel it ourselves from that moment on everyone else around us is no longer manipulated by it and on top of that spirits can no longer influence us and on top of that we're now feeling the terror and releasing it, which means that we have a hope of getting down to the causal emotion that actually will change us. Whereas if we don't choose to do that, we'll never get to that causal emotion that can change us. Yeah. So the key is to pray to God about some courage. You know, that, that quality, courage. Yeah. It's a very important quality that is required of us if we want to embrace God. And, and can I say from my own experience again, courage is not... I had this image of courage that was like, right, I'm going to do this. You know, Does anyone else it, you know? process fear like that? Yep, here I go. We're going to the fear. That's not courage. <laughs> the, the, the most courageous place I've found is the really... Uh, what I used to judge as very weak, soft place of going vulnerable. God, I don't know how to do this. I feel like I can't. I'm petrified. I'm going to step into this place now. And I believe it's, the, it's horrible things are going to happen to me as I step into it. But I'm just going to trust you in this moment. And it feels very out of control and weak. And I've come to learn, yeah, it's a submission to the emotion. Recently, I... Um, had a huge cry about um, the situation with my family. Since I met AJ, my family have been very, very angry at him and at me. Um, and initially, for the first year, I tried to talk to them <laughs> to make them understand that they were misunderstanding what was happening in my life, that this was actually a good thing and I was doing what I wanted. I was happy. Yes, I was scared. <laughs> I was very scared, but I felt this was the right thing to do that they didn't understand AJ, clearly they'd misunderstood, that didn't work. <laughs> then I decided that I couldn't have any contact with them anymore because it was so traumatic every time I did. Um, but then I tried to deal with their projections at me, which were quite angry and controlling, wanting me to come back and be the good daughter and ditch this guy and very condescending, you don't know what you're doing, we know better than you, all of this. So for about another year, <laughs> I had little cries here and there about that and I tried to put on a brave face. No, this is what I'm doing, this is what I want to do with my life, I know it's the right thing. And I was like toughing it out, I thought I was being strong and courageous. And just recently, I let myself really cry about the fact that I couldn't resist it anymore. I couldn't resist how horrible these projections were and how much they hurt and how much I thought that's it, you win. I, like, I, I feel your hooks into me so strongly that I feel like I'm not allowed to have my own life. I feel like I have to go back to you and I feel like that means I'm never, ever going to have the life that I want to have because I want to please you so much. That cry was the most healing cry that I've had in three years about my family issues. So it was a complete submission to how weak and vulnerable and uh, how much I felt I still had to please them. Yeah. yeah. The, the beauty of submitting is that you're submitting to the real feelings you have rather than the facade feelings. And remember we talked on Saturday about the facade self versus the injured self and then the real self. You remember that? And the defending place is defending the facade. It's, it's a place of trying to keep the facade in play. Whereas once we submit, if we, if we have courage, and it's not courage to go out and conquer the world, it's courage to actually just feel all of our own emotions. That's the only thing we need courage for, to have to do, is to feel all of our own emotions. When we have that courage and submit to that place, we've now shifted from the facade that we've created into this, this place that's the, the injuries we feel. And in that place, I'm willing to state the truth. Wow, I feel like giving up. That's how I feel. You know, and we're willing to just go and have a good cry about wanting to give up. Ironically, after we've done that, we won't feel like giving up as much. That's the irony. Yeah. But we don't know that 
before we have the cry generally. We just need to go into the, the place which is the, it contains the real emotions in that moment. Um, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, and so for me, I was living in defiance of these feelings that were coming. Like, I wanted to live in the loving, what I thought was most loving to me, and I was quite defiant, and actually I was quite angry at my parents this whole time. I wanted them to see, and I wasn't going to submit to what they were putting at me. And, and I thought that was being courageous. No, I'm living my life. It was only when I submitted to um, feeling like, I thought, that's it, I can't do it anymore. I, I'm going to have to go back to them... I'm, it's going to kill my soul. I'm going to feel like I, I, I can't be around them because they don't want me to be myself. But I literally cannot open to this life because I feel so oppressed by them. And I thought that, that I couldn't do it anymore. And then I had the cry. And, of course, then I have the courage, the real courage, to keep going with what honours me and not them. So, mm. yeah. Does that make sense, mate? Mm. Who else was feeling... I felt a lot of fear from the group when we were just arrived tonight, actually. So who else was feeling quite a lot of fear? Yeah, quite a few. So, yeah. The, um, the material we've put on the net about fear is really worth going over and over because it's sort of like... It's, it's, it's very hard when we're in the fear itself to actually believe that fear is more than a, not more than an emotion. You know, like we, we believe it has to be real. You know, it's like... How dare anybody tell me this is just an emotion, you know? Like, that's how we feel inside of ourselves. And we often feel quite angry that somebody even would suggest it's even just an emotion. Because it actually feels to us to be quite real. It feels to be something definite. And yet, uh, the irony is, when we go through into the fear itself, we start recognising, ah, yeah, it's a bad emotion. It's probably one of the worst human emotions we can experience. But it's still an emotion. It's not a reality. It's just an emotion. It's an emotion we need to feel and release, but it's just another emotion. Yeah. There are other emotions that are almost as bad, like shame is another one that's yeah, is almost as bad. Um, you know, but but the reality is if you can learn to embrace your fear and submit to it, you will find that any other emotion comes up you'll be fine with it. <laughs> because basically, once you've learnt to experience your own terrors, there's no other emotion that can, that can actually cause you any, any you know, that, that is worse to feel. So, yeah. yeah, once you let yourself experience that, then it's sort of liberating. For, for, yeah, f sorry, go. go for me, um, fear feels like this place of holding myself in suspension. Like, I'm not actually in anything. I'm trying to prevent things all the time. I'm just live. I'm prevent, 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 prevent. And I'm, like, suspended in space. And actually, even if the thing I fear happens, to then be in that, to be in that event and feel the emotions that it triggers is far easier than holding myself in this suspension all the time. It's like a not a real state. That's why so many people say fear is not real. And the, the truth is the things we fear might happen, but the, the state isn't a real state. We're actually afraid of the event happening and if we can just process everything we, we feel about the event, the fear will disappear. That's why so many times when you confront the thing you're afraid of, you're no longer afraid of it because you've dealt with the emotions that are there. But very often for most of us, we need to process the fear because the thing that we fear the most, like being raped and attacked, we don't need to have that experience in order to process the fear, do you know what I mean? So we can just go into the fear, process it, and we never have to actually experience that event. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, can I just mention a few more <coughs> things about the fear? Um, most people l stay in this state of fear. They say, oh, I'm feeling fear. But actually, they're not feeling fear. They're avoiding the feeling of fear. And, and because of the, the cho cho choice to avoid the feeling of fear, they are now going into this place where they're doing everything they possibly can to avoid the fear, but they don't realise actually it is tiring as, as you know, 
in your own life, right? It is one of the most tiring things and exhausting things to do, to constantly, constantly nurse your fear. It's like you're walking down the street, you go, oh, do I worry about that man? Oh, do I worry about this man? Oh, do, do, I, do I walk past? Oh, the, motel, the hotel's coming up on the side there. You know, there's, there's people standing out there, they're probably drunk, I need to go across the other side of the road. And, and you know, there's this constant... There's this constant thing going on over and over and over in your, in your own mind that, that is actually manipulating your entire life. Now you imagine if you could just walk down the road and be totally oblivious <laughs> to everything around you, or, but connected. In other, when I say oblivious, I mean in the sense of not responding to and knowing that you're going to be fine and we'd be able to cope with anything. You walk, in that space, you walk down the road and you're not going, you're thinking, oh yeah, it'd be nice to have a nice meal tonight. And you know, you're, you're thinking about all these other things that have nothing to do with being terrified. The problem with living in the fear is it creates this state of hyper alertness vigilance, and yeah. hyper vigilance. And we then live almost in this constant state of hyper vigilance. Our adrenaline glands, glands are just going fire and firing, firing, firing constantly. And we're in this hyper vigilant state constantly. And that is actually more exhausting than actually feeling the fear itself and releasing it. And this is the funny thing we do with a lot of our emotions. It's actually more exhausting to try to control them than it is just to feel them and release them. And that's the sad thing about a lot of our life. We, we, ha we have a tendency like with fear, well, let's call it what it really is because it's stronger than fear, isn't it? It's really terror. And what we're doing with it is we're being so hypervigilant, trying to actually nurse it. So what we're doing is we're yeah. nursing this as if it's like a little baby, you know, nursing our fear and protecting it from everything. And the, the, the uh, activity of doing that takes so much energy and force of will that, that every day we end up at the end of the day just totally exhausted. If we submitted to the emotion itself and just let it flow, the irony is all of a sudden, not only will all of our bodies start to relax, we'll be able to start to breathe and get some breath into us for the first time in our lives, but also our actual day-to-day -day experience is no longer dictated by the fear that we're nursing or the terror that we're nursing. And that's the beauty of our life then. Instead of, instead of nursing it like Mary said, living in this terror, we are now living a real experience which is, which is devoid of the fear and the terror. And it's actually more relaxing to feel the terror itself than it is to live in it. That's the irony of that emotion. And in fact, the irony of most emotions. It's more relaxing to actually feel them than it is to try to maintain an intellectual state or a pseudo state where we're trying to control them. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you going? You. Um, my question is about what's well, sort of relative to this um, imagination. What is the primary use of imagination, and what happens on the soul level when we imagine? Stuff? When we imagine, yeah. Well, I. Sp how do you spell it? Imagination? Yep. There's two, again, there's two sides to imagination, or perhaps I'm better off drawing them like two sides to imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, babe. That's all right. <laughs> so there's two sides to imagination. You could say there's, there's a, a loving side to imagination. A loving side, and then there's the fear side of imagination. <laughs> Isn't there? So, so imagination is a very powerful tool on a lot of us in a lot of ways. It also is a way in which God can communicate with us quite openly and freely if we use it in a loving way. But if we use it in a fear-based way, it's also a way that dark and negative spirits, spirits and also all the darkness on the earth can communicate with us through this imagination that we have that's used in a fear-based way. Now let me illustrate both. You pick up the morning paper... And on it it says, terror alert. So that's, you just see those two words, terror alert. Now, where, where does your imagination go immediately? 
It's like, oh no, here we go again. What's going to happen now? You know, like straight. This is it's geared to that, is it not? Like to 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 actually trigger your imagination into a certain way of thinking, and then they talk about. Bin Laden, right? So terror alert, Bin Laden's died, now there's going to be lots more difficulty with all of his followers and so forth. And, and what's that happening is we're now using our imagination to heighten our own fear, which, may, which fears may never be realised in our entire life, and yet we're now worried. Or for many of us here in Australia, even worse would be economic crisis, is the words. Right, the the blazoned on the front page of the paper, and we go, oh no, I've got my mortgage, and I'm already <laughs> struggling to pay my mortgage. We're going to lose our house, and you know we've got to go out and get another job, and rah, rah, and off we go. You know, all of a sudden our imagination is heightened, triggering all of our fears if if we use it in that direction, or we can use our imagination in loving directions. Has anyone got any ideas how we might do that? It's alright, she's got one. Oh, it's, um, a loving imagination might be imagining a world where everyone is at one with God or imagining a world where um, there is love that is the ruling, ruling emotion. So alright, and no, I'd just say, oh, that's just utopian dreaming, you know. <laughs> but if I imagine it with my emotions, for me, I actually start to feel a shift in my whole being. Like Very true. I can see it and feel it and know it and... I get really like mo moved. Yeah, that's it. So we can we can it can influence us positively, even though the world is already in a negative state around us. It can still influence posi us positively, and in particular, what, influence us positively to live a loving life, even though people around us are living differently. Yeah. What about with your art, Laura? I often draw pictures of when I'm at that place, and I also help people to find that place within their imagination and to draw it. And it's amazing because I've done it for lots of people in a room and everyone's imagination of, the, of a, the perfect ideal world is actually really very similar in terms of all nature, the attributes, the education, like everyone, there's a common, there's a common theme that, that is exposed when everyone thinks of the perfect yep. Yep. world. So it's very do you want to do an experiment about on these two lines? Yeah, now? Yeah. You don't mind with that? Okay. I'll choose a subject. <laughs> Is that all right if I choose the subject? Okay, let's choose the subject of earth changes. <laughs> My favourite. <laughs> it is Eagle's favourite. He's used his imagination in a fearful way. <laughs> now what I'm going to do is just get you to close your eyes for a moment. Just picture this. Right where you're living at the moment, you will look up and actually there will be a wave that's 600 metres high, heading in your direction. Right. And in the distance, you're hearing the crack, bang, crack, everything. The, it's so loud that it's like the loudest noise you've ever heard just coming towards you. And you all, of see, 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 all of a sudden, you see the ground itself like starting to open up and then lava coming out of the ground at the same time as this wave's coming towards you. And how are you feeling? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, the truth is that we can become so afraid just from our imagination that we can actually kill ourselves. You know, the Aboriginals perfected this with pointing the bone. That's the whole process. The whole process is that they knew that there were spirits who were quite dark behind the process of pointing the bone. They knew that they had been condemned by their own society once the bone had been pointed at them. That many of them would actually finish up just dying, right? Because of their own fear of that entire process. And the truth is in the future, many people will actually die because of their fear and no other reason. Right? Now. That's uh, Earth Changes. Now, just close your, mind for, uh, close your eyes again for a moment. Now, what's going to happen with Earth Changes? Can you tell me? Here in Melbourne. 
Can you see how hard it is to get that image I put into your mind just a few minutes earlier? <laughs> just, just, just by discussing something that connects you to your fear, that image is now very, very hard to shake once you think about the same subject in the same location. That's the trouble with our fears. Our fears finish up attaching ideas that are all fear-based to us. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that what I just said won't happen here in Melbourne. Right. <laughs> with regard to earth changes. But, let's, but, but can you see that we can use our imagination and we can actually also, if we're in a loving state, channel through our spirit friends, we can actually see pictures of what will happen here in Melbourne with regard to earth changes. Right. So how would we do that accurately, babe? Well, accurately is very difficult. The reason why is because we will have all of our fears mm -hmm. in place. And until we release a lot of our fears about earth changes, it's going to be very, very difficult to get an accurate picture from our spirit friends as to what those earth changes will be. Can you see that? Yeah? What if um, when I think of earth changes, the, the minute I see the tsunami, I go into instant God, my relationship with God, faith, like a real, like even if everything disappears, it's going to be me in the spirit world still with this same, like, yes, use well, it to build more of the, of, of the strength of the connection. I would argue with God. you that you're actually using your fear to build a connection with God. Uh, um, you see, when, when you're... Um, when you're in a state where you know what's going to happen to your body and you're fine with your body, you would surely just choose to do the best thing for yourself. So, for example, if you, had, if you allowed your imagination for a moment just to wander onto the subject of earth changes and you allowed the pictures to come to you of what would happen in your location and all you see is huge amounts of water and lots of like volcanic activity and earthquakes and so forth, then surely if you loved yourself, you'd go, OK or you trusted yourself, you'd go, OK, if that's what's going to happen in this location, do I want to be here in this location? Wouldn't you? W would you just stay there, knowing that those things would happen? Or wouldn't you want to then move to a place where it wouldn't happen? What would you do if you loved yourself? You would move to a location. You'd probably move, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, so if you're staying there and then you're going, oh, it's going to get me closer to God, this one... I'm saying if all of a sudden I saw, it, like saw the, the tsunami actually occurring mm -hmm. and my instant in my imagination was to go to God. What, oh, I would ask you, what, if you saw it occurring right in your front of your eyes, why didn't you send it, see it five months ago when you could have moved out of the way? Yeah, so it's almost like you have to get to that point before all of a sudden, the, the, like you say. Like the and why does it have to get to that point? Because the fear kicks in and then you realise that it's sure. the only way. What fears? Um, must be fear of death. I'm, I'm not. Well, it's not a fear of death because you stayed there and you're going to die. So it's a fear of what? So what? What fear would what fear cause you, you to block the to knowledge be in of denial Earth changes? of the knowledge? Yeah. Come on, Laurie. You know what fears? These are the fears you have. I know, and I'm pretty um, removed <laughs> from feeling them. Um, the. F this is what happens sometimes. I'm split off now a little bit from the... the what, what's what's yeah, one of your yeah. biggest fears? You mentioned yep. it on Saturday. You remember? You were there playing, uh, singing with Fab. You, know, you remember this scenario that you painted to us on Saturday where you were singing with Fab and yep. somebody came along and stood right next to you and <laughs> what did they do? Yeah. What was You're that? Being Oh, my mum. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, your mum. Oh, God, mom. yeah. Fear. It, it's fear of attack, actually. Of family? Attack. Yeah, Fab just said one too. Twice. What? twice. What? He's read it twice. twice. Fear of Isha's school. Yeah, well, you know, you want to set up a nice... Microphone. <laughs> you wanted to go to a nice school and there's a school that's nice right next to us so you want the kids to go to the school. Okay. So it's sort of the lifestyle kind of exactly. issues, like yeah. what feels comfortable, what I value, yep. 
I suppose if I was to summarise all my fear, it would be the fear of, st- like, my, a, a, f- a fear of that I'm not going to grow, fear of stagnation. You know what, if, what I would, how I would summarise it? How? <laughs> not being cool. That was, um, yep, definitely that takes me back to 16, trying to fit in with everyone. And can you see even the choices you're making now for your children are a bit about not being cool? Wanting to be cool. Wanting yeah. to be cool. Wanting to be cool. Wanting to fit f- cool, in. fit in. Even not fitting in is being cool? Because oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, hey, I'm an expert. <laughs> There's this oh, whole area in Brisbane. I'm alternate. There's this whole area in Brisbane that's alternate and they think they're very, very cool being alternate. No? Yeah. You know, how many of you like listening to pop music? Uh, and how many of you would be absolutely disgraced if somebody, if you had to put up your own hand about that <laughs> subject. Because I know that there are many people, particularly ones under 30, who just can completely condemn popular music. Um, why? Like mainstream music. Mainstream yeah. popular music. Why? Because it's not cool. You can't even get a gig with it these days. Very true. Bigger than ever. It's making yeah. it bigger than ever? Like, so pop music's making millions and millions of dollars out there and yet you can't get a gig with it in a pub. So what if, if you're not cool, what, what, what are you? Like as in, I'm just trying to get closer to my fear because I feel that at 16 but now at 35 I don't feel so connected to it. But Trust, really me, trust me, a lot of your decisions in your life and even many of the ones you're making right, right now, now are based around this fear. <laughs> so what am I afraid of if I'm not cool? Well, what happened when you were 16... <laughs> When you were 16 and you weren't a cool kid, what was it like? Well, I was the smart one, so I started um, pretending that I got worse grades. Pretending you were dumb? marijuana. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's what you did. What would have happened if you stayed the smart kid? I, uh, I wouldn't have been liked by the boys. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Which boys have you attracted over the time since? Cool. Very cool. 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 <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no more microphone, no Don't more. Don't want any more of this truth. <laughs> what if there's also like, you know, the family, like you, you know, separated couples, they've got one child with one family and they have to leave that child to go to follow their dreams. Well, or this is what I say, fear of family attack is a huge or thing. Or family loss. Or family loss, yeah. 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 Many or people are willing to die rather than to leave a child, for example. Yeah. If that child doesn't want to leave, like, like, like my feelings are, if the child wants to stay where they are, well, that's okay. Like, if they have the means to do so, let them stay. And mm. um, that doesn't mean you have to. What about mortgages? And if you and you got a debt, but your house won't pay off your debt, and then you, you know, you're gonna have, you know, you know, hundred thousand dollars that you have to pay, but you, you know, you're gonna leave and. Well, these yeah. kind of responsibilities, like you got responsibilities. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you have to honour your responsibility. Well, it's yeah. loving, isn't it? If yeah. you've entered a contract with someone to honour exactly. the contract. Yep. Can you see how many of our fears are not really about losing our life? In fact, for many of us, we'd prefer to lose our life than have some of these fears. <laughs> And isn't that's why it's a bit tricky because they're not the ones that make you feel suspended and they're not the ones that... Oh, they are oh, if you go into yeah. them speaking from experience. These are the ones <laughs> that completely dominate and control your life. Completely dominate and control it. When Many you, of you yeah. right now are not following your desires and passions only because of stuff like this. Okay, yeah. Yep, come here. Where I had a problem was um, the first desire I want to have is for God. Yep. And the second's for my soulmate. Yep. But we have children yep. as well. Yep. So it's, I'm finding it hard to find that responsibility to the kids, but having the other two. I've said this before. There's really, when you're in desire, there's really no such, and love, there is really no such thing as responsibility in a lot of ways. The only responsibility you have is to take personal responsibility for your own emotions. That's all. There is no other responsibility. There's only love and desire. So, so if I desire God and if I desire my soul, surely, and I do that in a loving way, God and soul, 
which means myself and the other half of my soul, then surely every other decision I make is going to be loving for everyone How around me, including be? my children. Yeah. Now, it right. might expose some of the unloving addictions we had with our kids in the past. Or some of the children's unloving addictions that they have with you. <laughs> you understand? Like, many of our children, we've taught now, it's not cool to do this or it's not cool to do that. And so, so when we say, oh, we're going to live in the middle of Timbuktu, you know, that's not cool. You know, let's go to Sydney or Gold Coast or... I suppose just with that, AJ, is... Um, um I find myself getting torn between God's laws, like, mm -hmm. um, and then man's laws. Yeah, but why do you feel torn? Um, do you, can you feel the reason why? Towards my children. Why so, towards your children? Um, well, like with education. Specific example. You yeah, um, with education. Yeah, yep. fine. So I want to take my children away. Away um, where? From where we are and, and have them in a, um, away from the environment. Why? Um, uh, so the environment hasn't got such an influence on them. So the decision making so is, is a fear-based one. Or so you're control. afraid. So you're of afraid of the influence the environment's having on your kids. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's fear, okay. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Is that love? No. So therefore, should you do it? <laughs> no. Is it a loving desire? No. It's not a loving desire. No. It's fear-based. So yep. whenever we have a fear-based desire. Don't, don't act upon them, just feel them. So instead is to feel the fear of what it is you, you feel is going to happen to your kids in this environment. Yeah. To the truth that is that once you enter the loving state, you will no longer be afraid about your children and where they have been brought up with school and all those kind of things. In fact, we've actually recommended to many parents that they actually send their children back to school. Because they've been homeschooling. Be because them. they've been homeschooled for so long that the children now control the parents. <laughs> Right, and the, and the parents haven't got a life anymore because they are totally under the control of their own children. Right, and also many people have this idea of like, no, I want my kids to be around people who are owning their emotions and doing the right thing, and blah blah blah. blah. The truth is, many of the parents are still struggling to own their own emotions. Exactly. So they're in more in, in <laughs> case often more than some of the people in their environment. <laughs> and especially, they're particularly hooked into their kids with their addictions. So they're keeping them in an environment that they're telling themselves, out of fear, very often of their own schooling experiences, mm -hmm. that they're doing a loving thing. But the concerning thing for me, for us is that they're also creating uh, separation between people on this path and the rest of the world. And that's really not the message of this teaching. No. The teaching is about loving everyone in the world <laughs> and being in the world. And so when we, when we try to prevent our children from interacting with the world, there's definitely a fear that we're avoiding. Much more beautiful wouldn't it be to be equipped our children with knowledge of God, knowledge of God's laws, love, instill in them self-worth through our own emotional work and let them go out into the world and feel what's there because they're going to, they're existing in the world anyway. So, Did yeah. you have a religious background? Yeah, I was Catholic. Yeah. Do you ever remember the statement that is quoted in the Bible that I said, let your light shine before men? I've heard you say it before, yes. Okay. Now, how can you let your light shine before men if you're around no men? <laughs> in other words, that you're just living by yourself in your own little community and everybody else doesn't even know what you're doing. Is that letting your light shine before men? No. No, it's letting your light shine before your friends. We, we want to be the light of the world, not just the light of you know, our little tiny community. Our living room. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's... It, every time we think about pulling children out of something, it's usually fear-based. Like we need to look at our fears. And often in that circumstance, our children will resist it as well because they're a lot more in tune with what desire is than fear generally. So how would we do it from a loving perspective? What would we do yeah. if we loved, do you think, in that situation? So if we were on this site, what do you think we'd do? So you're afraid of the education system and how it's going to distort the child's viewpoints? Yes. Yep. So uh, if you come at it from a position of love, what would you do? That's a good question, isn't it? Yes. Notice how we don't think very much about the good question. <laughs> we think more about the bad question, the, well, the fear-based question. Well, we think about <laughs> preventing the fear, don't we? 
And so, we disguise that as loving. This most yeah, of the loving I've, practice on the which planet is, what I've is done. Told yourself. Yeah. 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 Yep. So so I'm let's let's yeah. look at it differently now. Let's go ask ourselves, all right, if I was not in fear of the education system and I wasn't in the state where I was worried about what it was doing to my children and afraid of what the overall results would be, what would I choose to do then? Yeah, I, I, uh, I've probably felt back and forth between those two things. So, but but, but do you but notice you have more answers yeah, on this slide <laughs> than there is on this slide? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So and this what, is something most yeah. people have. You wouldn't ignore that you have the fear. You, in fact, you'd own it even more. Mm. At the moment, you're in that living in space with it. You'd go into the fear, wouldn't you? If you chose to be loving, you'd go, okay, I can't make a clear decision because I, fear is driving me in this moment. Mm. So the only way I can be more loving is to own my fear and release it. Yes. Yeah. So then you would go into, well, get specific. What am I afraid of? Mm. What's going to happen to my kids? What are they learning? That, and what does that remind me of? And oh my gosh, what happened to me at school? Da, 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 da. Mm. Oh. Now we're suddenly at some emotion that is driving this fear. Yeah, yeah. Many yeah. of which will be emotions that we actually have never released since our own childhood of going to school, actually. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And once we <laughs> so get once rid of those, yep. what would we do? What would we do then? Well, I could make a choice then. Then exactly. you could make a loving choice based on a few possibility of decisions that are all loving. And ironically, you might still choose to remove your kids from school. Yeah, and I can really see that process. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I've been stuck in the middle of it. Yeah. Yep. So if I really get deep into that yep. and go back to how um, probably schooling affected me as well. Yep. Yeah. And um, I'd be able to, yeah, come out the other end. That's Thank it. you. Yeah, that's it. Getting back to your life, Laura, if that's okay. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I would like to say a few things about it. Um, ironically, it is the fear of these kind of things which actually drive almost all of our life-based choices for our children. Right? So, so instead of choosing to do things based on desire and passion, which is really what we need to learn to do, if we want to have a, a, a joyful existence in our own life, what we finish up doing is we finish up making choices based on fear of these other things. And in particular, the fear associated with things like family and friends and, and environment, what our family, friends and environment will think or feel about us. You think about this, this is, this is actually done from the moment that we enter the world by the time we're five years of age, by the time we even go to school here in Australia, we already have our parents' conception of what's acceptable in the world in which we live. And, and almost all of our choices throughout the rest of our life are governed by those factors, far more than what you would realise. So, at the moment, Fab would like to go to a different place, would he not? Yep. You had to look at him? <laughs> Don't you know that already? <laughs> you know that already, surely. <laughs> yeah. But he's staying with you, why? Uh, I thought he was staying because his daughter, 50-50 custody with his ex-wife. There's only two reasons why he's staying. Because I would actually love to leave Melbourne again. No, you don't. I don't agree with you at all. I've, I've just got back to Melbourne after being away for seven years. So yep. I think that I'm, I've, instead of running away, I thought I'm not going to run away from Melbourne. I'm going to actually base myself and, and not be flying all over the place anymore. So. Laura, you love Melbourne. But not Melbourne. There's something in Melbourne you really love. What is it? My mum. Ah. Oh. The same person you're fearful of, remember? <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the person. You see, that, that's the person who pulls you back here. Yeah, and she's just, she's just lost her mother and her best friend. So now I've got even more of a, if I leave her, she's got no, nobody. Exactly. Mm. And so instead of following your desires and passions, 
whose desires and passions are you really... My mum. Yep. And, and the last thing she'd want is me to be any associated with anyone saying they're Jesus. That's it. Yep. Yeah. So, so even acknowledging that you know me would be a major trouble. Yeah, well, I speak to her about it to feel my fears, but yep. she just goes, yeah, you've been doing this for a long time. It's she, <laughs> like she's just condescending. Yeah. Completely dismissive. Yeah. 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 And yet you're still guided by her opinion. Yeah. Yeah. A lot in your, uh, I mean by the, the decisions the, in yeah, your life. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the guilt because I know, oh, I've got, I have a feeling that she, she could be very, like, suicidal in a very dark place and it would be my fault. Yeah, but see, suicidal is really anger taken to its extreme. Yeah, I think she's got that in yeah, her. So, That's so the fear I have from when I was little and I saw her. She'll really use that it. as a threat yeah. in terms to control you, so yeah. certainly. But, but that doesn't make you responsible for her if she decides to suicide because you don't want to live in Melbourne. Yeah, I've got to get that emotionally. It's still... Of course. Yeah. It hasn't yeah. landed in this my This is brain. what I'm saying to you. I'm not, I'm not saying these things to embarrass you. No, I'm but not even What I'm saying is if you can allow yourself to feel the power of that one pull, that one pull that's almost forcing your decisions about your life that, that actually have nothing to do with Laura's desires and passions. Mm. They've just got everything to do with mum's desires and passions, what mum would really want you to do and what mum views or condescends towards. What mum views as important or what mum views as something that she's condescending towards mm. manipulates your choice. It doesn't manipulate your own mind because you've worked beyond that now. In other words, you have your own opinions mm. about these things, but you still choose to do what she wants you to do, irrespective of your own opinions, mm. which is actually a sacrifice of yourself. Yeah. Now, I put to you that sacrificing yourself is never loving to yourself and therefore never going to create happiness. Mm. So, and also, there is the risk that when you feel about all things like earth changes and other issues, you may decide that actually Melbourne's not a very nice place to be and yet your mum will keep you here mm -hmm. until such a time as you emotionally... Yeah. I think I've also struggled with what's selfish, like as in it, it, that would be selfish on me to leave... No, you don't struggle with that. Oh, okay. Your mum does. Because oh, what your mum does, says is... Yeah. Anything that's not what I'm telling you to do means you're selfish. Yeah, she says it often too. <laughs> she does. And so the reality is that it, you know what's selfish and what selfish isn't, but the reality is that you still take on your mum's definition of when you are selfish. And her definition of when you are selfish is all the times that she's selfish, actually. Do you follow me? Yeah. <laughs> In and other words, she is being selfish, <laughs> imposing her life upon you. And it's funny because fear does that. Like if I came up to you and went, Laura, you're totally selfish if you leave Melbourne. You'd go, no, I'm not. <sighs> what are you talking about? Like I want to go and do this thing with my partner. It's going to be great. But the fear of, and speaking from experience, the fear of our family's attack can make us doubt saying, what Laura, we wouldn't... you're a selfish person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. how she goes. Well, the, when, when I left the first time, she called the um, private detectives and the police find out where I was because I said to her I need to soul search, I need to feel what's going on, I'm full of rage and I don't know why, I just need to get away and to feel what's happening in me and she lost it because she felt that she was losing that control. Exactly. Even when I was away for seven years she still had the control, even when I had no contact with her mm -hmm. verbally, I could still feel like a vampire, yeah. like this energy she still had on me. Because the yeah. emotion's still in you. Yeah. And that's why even if now you go, no that AJ guy's right. I don't want to be in Melbourne, see your mum, and she's calling you selfish and you go, no, I'm going, unless you deal with the fear, she still have that. And unless you deal with the that, underlying emotional you know, guilt yeah. as it's well. that false courage that you were talking yeah. about. I thought I was courageous, yeah. but I was just totally Defiance, running away. Rebellion. But I couldn't run. For, even when I was in Egypt, I still felt her, and I'm like, how can my mum still be here? I haven't spoken. Yeah. She was in, she's in my being. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And she will remain so, because remember... Remember the map we just did earlier? Here's Laura. Sorry about the dress. <laughs> and, and remember, there's the shield, your emotional shield around you. And you've got these holes. And one of these holes is a huge vortex towards your mum. So whatever your mum thinks, even, is automatically entering you because of this hole. Whatever she thinks, Laura feels Laura has to think. Whatever mum feels, Laura feels Laura has to feel. 
Right? Now, you know that whatever she's feeling a lot of times is actually out of harmony with love and fear-based and also very controlling and manipulative, but that doesn't change the fact that you have this opening here that means that your mum is really remotely controlling you still. So we can be 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60. I know a man who I've talked to just recently, he's 70 something, his mum's just passed away and his mum still controls him from the spirit world. While mum was alive, he had to ring her every night. And if he didn't ring her every night, Anger. she would automatically project rage at him. But she wouldn't go, yell, 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 because that might turn him away. So what she'd go is, oh, you didn't ring me last night. <laughs> Can't you consider your mum enough to ring her? You know, all that kind of emotional black master. And that's because he has that hole that's not been patched up yet, right? Linked to, him, to his mother. And as a result, his mother manipulates and controls him constantly. He can't go anywhere without ringing his mother. And yet he's married, he's got grandchildren, and yet he's still ringing his mum every day until she passed. So it's and a now, fundamental fear be, um, being my own identity. Um, it's a large part of yeah. it, obviously. For me, Laura, it's been a lot of fear of rage initially. But then fear of the feeling. You know, as, we, as we're raised, we're told, as you were just saying before, by the time we're five, we know what's good and bad in the world. And that's mum and dad's definition, isn't it? So what they say is a good man, we go, that's good. What they say is bad, is bad. Uh, what you should eat, you should eat. You know, it, pretty much it's pretty much set in us. And many of us are still living that with that set of values. The minute we start to go, and I'm, ex I'm still experiencing it, no, actually, I don't agree with that value. Firstly, the fear of their rage shut me down heaps. <laughs> so I c it was very hard for me to even, like, maintain that emotional space of, actually, I don't feel what your definition of love is my definition of love. And then I got to sort of where you're at, like, well, no, that's, I don't want that love, but there's still the emotional hook. And what, um, what my guides told me a while back is that Many of us have this fundamental fear of being a bad girl or a bad boy because the minute we step outside their operations of what is good and right, immediately to them we're a bad girl and that comes from when we were this big and because we weren't receiving love unconditionally, we were receiving approval, the minute we step outside and we called it love, so when I'm a good girl I get the approval, when I'm a bad girl I, it's withdrawn, the minute I step outside of that I feel like I feel in my bones I'm a bad girl and I don't have the approval anymore and I feel totally unloved. And I feel that's a big issue that I'm still working through, yeah. The Would you add to I that? I was reading the Alice Miller books about childhood and I started grieving not my childhood, I was grieving all my mums because yeah. my mum, I won't go into the story, but I, I'm like, this isn't my life, this is my mum. And I was in tears grieving, going, why am I grieving... A life that I didn't even yeah. have. Well, and this is what many of us have done who've really identified with our parent. I'm exactly the same with my dad. When all this stuff happened and he started projecting, like, rage, violent rage, yelling, abuse, I was feeling for him and his sad childhood more than I could connect to the grief of what was happening to me. And or that's the grief of the attack itself. Or the attack, yeah, that's mm. what I mean, yeah. Mm. Um, and that's a ploy that I feel I took on very young. Like, that's how I got Daddy's approval, is to make him feel better. And I became very connected to his pain. So it's a big unravelling to find me, like you were saying, being your real self. Yeah. Just recently, uh, myself and Mary gave a talk uh, called Threats, Bribery and Blackmail. Yeah. Yep. And in that, we described the process that most people use to control another person. And usually as parents, whether we're a parent or we've had parents, usually parents use those three techniques quite strongly. And we've got to learn, if we want to love, we've got to learn to give up those techniques. And if we've, uh, and one of the ways to give them up, of course, is to recognise when other people are doing them with us. And the unfortunate thing is that fear is the primary motivator for most of the human race. So while I threaten... While I bribe, 
and even resorting to blackmail. Can you give an example of emotional blackmail? So a threat though? is, in your case, um, there's this uh, threat that, uh, well, let's look at this situation you, you had on the, that you related on the weekend. Um, you were there, you had guests, uh, it, was, it was Fab's birthday, I understand, and you were there enjoying your time with Fab, not looking after the guests necessarily. Uh, which, which were, were your parents. parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, didn't, I wasn't making the coffee and we're like, and you, the percolator's there. I'm like, we're having, we're in the middle of a song. Yeah, we're in the middle of a song, enjoying ourselves, right? And, and where's the threat? Where did the threat start? All I know is I didn't even look at her, but I just felt this strong presence stand right next to me, exactly like that, like with her hands crossed. Hands folded. Didn't say a word, but, but smashing me with... I was literally getting at totally attacked yeah. of get up and attend to your guests now because I'm embarrassing her as a mother. Yeah. Like a disgust, like... Yeah. How dare you make me look bad because this is your house and these yeah. are your get like yeah. all that coming from any, her without any words. Without any words. So there's the threat. Where's the bribe? Do what I say or I'll get angry at you. Exactly. So so if you do what she says, what do you get then? Approval. Ah. She'll back off and be soft. So if you had have just put there's down the, the guitar and gone and made it, it. Oh, that's better. Yeah, yeah, there's the bribe. There's yep. the bribe. Where's the blackmail? You didn't do it, right? You stayed playing. Yeah. Yep. How'd you feel? I was just shiver. I was just shake. I was shaking. I was really, really, really scared. And did your mum care? No. She she didn't think it was working. Maybe that's why she was there longer. Like really, it was almost like a, a, a an entity. It wasn't my mum. It was an entity, like with the power of like ten. Yeah. Ten other people, yeah. It was yeah just ten angry mothers. Yeah. <laughs> it was massive. Yeah. So the blackmail was the threat of violence which you were receiving? Probably the threat of being the withdrawal that I would have got after it, of the, the withdrawal. So what happened other. afterwards? Um, well, the, ne the, the next day actually we went there and she said to me, um, she said, you know what, I'm not going to attend to any of my guests and I'll just go and watch television. You got there. up. You the, ended up doing it. There's the blackmail. Oh, yeah, yeah, you did it, yeah. yeah. And, and, and she blackmails you by cutting off. Yeah, that's it. There's the blackmail. I'm not going to help you with your life. You wait, if Fab leaves you, you're, you, you don't come running back to me kind of thing. All that, yeah. yeah. There's the blackmail. Your mum's great at it. She's very good. Many I'm parents so, I'm are. I'm totally sucked in. Well, when you say you're totally sucked in, you have an emotional openness to receiving it. And the key is to patch up that. Because once you patch that up, you will have some love for yourself. And you know, ironically, in that place, you will no longer be able to respond to any of these techniques of manipulation. And remember how you said, oh, these fears are not the suspension fears. But I feel that you're in suspension. You're like, mm. I can't, no, she's here now. I can't enjoy my time with Fab. I, like, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, not going to do it, like the defiance that we both have. I'm not going to do it because I know that's not loving. But um, you're in suspension of your own emotional experience. Mm. And mm. so I feel that fear is the major thing that creates the opening. So, yeah. The now, what began all of this was a discussion about imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and can you, see, can you see, once we start using our imagination, we start imagining things that may even never happen. Like... Your mum may not attack you, although given your mum's background, probably will. <laughs> your lifestyle may not change for the worst, but given past experience, that might happen. <laughs> right? You might not look cool anymore. But you might love it. But you might like it. And actually, that might be the new cool. <laughs> 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 and who knows, when you exercise your desire, the mortgage issue might just melt away. You don't know. You don't know what will happen. Recently, we've, we've had friends who have exercised their desire in a very, very poor market and got $100,000 more than what they were told they would get. And then we have other friends in the same market who are not exercising their desire and have had their house on sale for a year and never sold it. Not even had anyone look. So, do you think they have a desire? Mm. 
to sell it, really? Or is there emotional fears in play? You see, when you, this is the thing we don't acknowledge in God's universe. That God's universe responds to loving desires. It's and in fact, more so than it responds to our fears, even. It's the most powerful force in the universe, loving desire. Yep. And that's why when you step into God reliance, some of you who've done the opening to God, I talk about that in there, where if we, if we define for a minute God reliance as following my passions and desires in humility... So recognising that if I follow this desire and the law of attraction brings me something pretty nasty, I'm going to recognise that there must be an error here and I've got to feel about it. There might be so not be an error with the desire. It might be just that you have some other error. That well, yep. she is, my mum even told me, why do you always have to do kinesiology and therapy and all this emotional stuff? You're always getting a small market. You know, I can't talk to people about what you do and help you because I don't know what you're on about. Like she's always, it's a big mockery of... Of everything you've Why ever don't done. You do something normal. That's yeah. what my mum said talk to me. About what am I going to tell people you're doing now? Yeah. <laughs> you used to be in Beirut. Now you, I can't. She can't even say it. Yeah. She goes. Sometimes I just say massage because it's the easiest thing. I'm like, <laughs> I don't massage because I don't know what you do. <laughs> so it's it's condescending. Well, Very. can you see how much of her definition of you is driving your life, but also stifling your imagination in a loving direction? Do you see that? Like it's stifling you from actually following any pure passions and desires you have. And and yeah, uh, yeah. Oh. That's what I was going to say. When you step into your desires passionately and go, okay, whatever feedback I get, I'm going to feel about it, your desires get more and more purified the more you go on. And in the end, you end up in this space of really pure, loving desire. And then you're unstoppable. Then $100,000, doesn't matter. It's, it's dealt with. Can I just ask a question with the desire? When you're fully engaged in your desire, you're passionately loving your desire, is it automatically, like sometimes for me it feels selfish or self-absorbent because my desire is everything about my own processing, my dancing, my singing, my art. Because I'm not serving, does that mean that there's a fear to actually, that's, that's blocking being of service or it could just be at the process that I am... Well, I would say when you're serving, though, you're in full connection with yourself and your own desires. Otherwise, it's not real service. Sacrifice is not service. So that's an important distinction. Do you know what I mean by that? But I was going to be even more rough with her. I was just going to say, <laughs> yeah. Laura, you're a selfish little girl, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> which is what your mum says, isn't it? Um, the truth is, with desire and passion, is usually if we exercise our desire in a pure manner, other people will automatically benefit from the exercise of that desire. So we will automatically be of service to others in the, in the pursuit yep. of that desire. The service might not necessarily mean you're out there with a whole, you know, like a... You might not practice. have a whiteboard. It just might mean yeah. that your friends can, are coming over. Like when friends come over our house, they're in tears automatically because we yeah. have that intention that it's a safe space for people. Yep. So That's is that a service or is service something more... Like I'm, you know... So if you're worried about whether you have to be world famous to be a service. I'm not world famous, <laughs> but yeah, practicing. Maybe that's even my mum's stuff. That whole profession, like, yeah, I know it. it's my mum. Can you yeah. see how yeah. many of your definitions <laughs> are related to mummy? No more. This <laughs> is it terrible. <laughs> let's, let's put this microphone away. It's terrible. <laughs> it's okay to feel that. The, the truth is that the majority of us still have our parents all over us. Emotionally, like all over us. And when uh, this is their whole thing on this path, like along with my addictions, I went, okay, I'm going to see where my parents are in my life. My parents are how I wash up, how I iron, what I eat when I eat, what I think is good, what I think is bad, how you should spend your money. What how cars you any your good? Money. What, what, what house is <laughs> any good? What push bikes any good? What <laughs> What's a good man? Good. What's a good woman? <laughs> what you should do on your holidays, what, how long you should sleep in, when you should go to bed, what you should watch. Like that, that's how much of my life. It's everything. <laughs> now, does it make you feel a bit creeped out when, that, when you start? Thinking? How much of your life is actually you? Is actually your desires? It's funny, uh, I, I recommended to Mary some time ago, and she, she followed through with this recommendation, of making a list of all of the major things she felt and believed and then how and then what her family felt and believed about the same subject and her friends felt and believed about the same set subject and then after she'd considered that what did she actually feel and believe 
it's fascinating. What's my belief about religion? Okay, I'll just write that down off the top of my head. Then I go, well, what does my dad feel about religion? Yep, I know that pretty well. <laughs> write that down. What does my mum feel? Yep, got that. What does my brother feel? Right. What do my friends feel? What does society as a whole feel generally in Australia about religion? Okay, so my first thing that I thought was what I feel, it's just a conglomeration of everything, mainly my dad, but bits, bits of other things in there as well. And then to sit with, okay, well, what, if, I, if, it wasn't, if I wasn't in fear of all those people, if I didn't want to be cool to society and I wanted to prevent my dad's attack, what would I actually feel about these things? And it was amazing. <laughs> I'm actually not that opposed to religion. <laughs> I've been fighting it all my life. Um, and I go, well, no. Like, yep, it's not perfect, but I really love God and I really think there's something beautiful about people coming together to try and find God. So I don't actually hate religion. I don't want to join one, but I don't hate it. And, but I'd been wandering around mad as a hatter at religion all my life. And it wasn't anything to do with what I actually felt. It was my fear of attack and not being cool. That's what it came down to. And most, like, then I went through what's a good man, what's a good woman, what's a good wife, what's a good daughter, um, politics, Jesus. What's a good man um, is anything other than Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> According to mum, dad, society, brothers, <laughs> family. <laughs> It's a fascinating exercise, though. I recommend it, is it to a everyone. Exercise. And it, it's not maybe you maybe you're not processing causally, but you're opening your eyes to just how much is there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Now, should we have, be a bit more positive about our imagination yes. for a moment? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Igor's like, I'm shutting it down. I'm throwing away the key. <laughs> Igor, you are an expert at this part of your imagination, <laughs> as you well know. So. Um, and, and this is one of the things that guides many of the questions that you make is because you're imagining the worst in many cases or imagining bad things happening or so forth. But also you have this lovely part of your soul which, which actually does imagine in a loving way as well, which is one reason that drives your passion to serve people in the way that you have been doing for the last six months or so uh, in terms of getting the truth out to the world in, a, in the best possible manner. And this, the beauty of imagination in a loving way is that it will always have some basic qualities that are very, very different to the fear-based qualities of imagination. So if we look at the qualities of loving imagination, what would you come up with as a quality of loving imagination? Can I start you off? Yes. Right. Okay. Right. So, so number one quality, I feel, is optimism. Oh. No, I can't spell it. Optimism. <laughs> Can I just point out that most of us are so used to being pessimistic. And cynical. And it's, cynical. You know? It's kind of cool to be cynical. So when I go, imagine the world, imagine there's no heaven. <laughs> you know, what John, John <laughs> yeah. Lennon's imagination, right? And... Imagine a world living in peace and harmony. Who feels angry when they try and imagine that? Yeah, and who feels like that's not going to be possible? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty disillusioned and there's no way that that's going to ever be an outcome. It's great to try for, but never going to happen. Can you see how optimistic imagination is difficult? Because the world is just geared to pessimism. Right? And so we're not used to using our imagination in, a, in an optimistic way. The second thing I would like to mention about it, you can add to it later if you want, is desire. Like, imagination that's loving always activates desire. Always activates desire. Right? So what's an example of this, babe? So I'll give you an example. For a start, if I'm, if I'm imagining, imagining a certain thing, so for example, I'm imagining uh, what my house could look like. Right? Now, at the moment, it's just this, well, to be frank, at the moment, our house <laughs> is... <laughs> well, it doesn't have walls at it the moment. It doesn't have any walls. Or tiles. Yep. Or tiles on the floor. It's been completely scun out of the inside. It has no bathroom or toilet or anything else <laughs> at the moment. That's our house. So, um, so there's my house, and I imagine 
in an optimistic and desirous way, I just can imagine it nice and crisp, clean and tidy and neat, everything in its place, everything having an orderly space, you know, bright. Before what, what it was, was it, you know, that, that old style wood panelling. Wood panelling, you know. So it's not real wood, so it's you just walk printed in there on and, the panels. And you see brown, 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 and brown. Tiles are brown. Everything's brown. Mucky grout in between, <laughs> yeah. can't clean it. And the tiles were lifting up. And, it, and so I'm sitting there in this house imagining, like, with optimism, what uh, it could look like, even if it was just the same size house, and what it could look like. Now, the instant I start doing that, the interesting thing, an interesting thing happens, and that is I start feeling a desire to create what I'm imagining. Do you see that? So, so I start feeling a desire. Now, like, as many of you may know now, Mary and I, we usually spend every piece of penny that we get on doing all sorts of things like travelling around and all those kind of things. So we don't get much money to spend on our house. We've had a little bit of an emotion about it actually. And, and so, so what happens is our house gets worse and worse and worse of course in its condition. And, and, but I'm sitting there going, no, no, our house could actually look like this and we could turn that into office and we could have it as a guest house sort of thing for people to come and visit and so forth and so forth. And anyway, we're just imagining and Mary's and we're discussing and then now both of us start imagining. All right, so... The other thing is, imagination in a loving direction is always infectious. Right? It, it actually ha is like a virus in a positive way, in the sense that it, it, it goes along to other people and infects other people and affects them in a positive and optimistic direction, not in a negative way. You know, <coughs> we see the opposite to that in the world today, don't we? Like, in the, in the world today, what we see instead is the infection is along a fear-based course. Right? So, you know, how do we have a run on the stock market? By one person in the newspaper saying, tomorrow is going to be a bad day <laughs> on the stock market. And if that one person happens to be the US Fed Reserve General, the General Director of the US Federal Reserve, now we've got a run <laughs> for sure the next day. One person. All, all, all he's got to do is a negative thing, fear-based thing, and bang, everybody follows that. But in a loving way, it generates optimistic desire and it's infectious to others. Like, it starts to enc encourage and involve others in the passion and desire. So can you say it's <coughs> expansive? Mm. It's, it's a growing thing. In the end, it doesn't just include you. Right? It finishes up including others in, a, in its, in its uh, vision, if you like. So, so a loving imagination is focused towards not only just helping yourself but also assisting and helping all of those around you. So in other words, it's inclusive and sharing. Does that make sense? That's what a loving imagination does. So if I use my imagination in a loving way in the case of the house, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, what we would like is it nice and it has all these functional things but it also... What we know we're going to need at some point in the future is some kind of office where people can come and do work on different things about, you know, the divine truth, you know, where they can just come there and instead of having to worry about whether Mary and AJ are in their own emotions doing something, we, we could have it where it's empty and people can just come there, do their work, go away. We don't even have to be there, right? So the desires start increasing further along that direction. Now as these desires increase, and we've been talking about these desires for, I don't know, how long? How long have we been talking about them? Six, eight months. Maybe eight months or something like that. About th two months ago, maybe three, three, three months ago, a friend of ours came and offered us the funds to do that work. All right? With no strings attached. So a friend of ours has given us the funds that we could just go ahead and right as we, uh, while we're down here, our actual home up there is getting gutted and all of those things that we imagined are now happening. That makes sense? Yeah. And that's how imagination in an optimistic way will work. It'll just, you just carry it out, carry it out. Now we didn't know where we were going to get the funds to do those kind of things. All the funds we get we spend on 
doing all of these other things, you know, all of these things to do with the divine truth and websites and printing books and printing DVDs and doing all that kind of stuff. And so we didn't know, but the, but the person who offered us the funds said, we want you to use the funds for yourselves. We, that was the proviso of receiving them, actually. Huh? So imagination in loving place also activates desire, activates passion, it's infectious, it's, opt it's optimistic, it actually is inclusive and Can we sharing. say it's inspiring? And it inspires. Yeah. So it's pretty valuable to have imagination, hey? Now, can I just point out one other thing about it? If you use your imagination in this direction, an interesting thing happens with spirits as well. That's what I was in that, loving spirits who have very optimistic viewpoint of their life, who are also close to God, can now influence your loving imagination into a direction that's more and more closer or more in harmony with God's laws and principles and more in harmony with God's desires. So ironically, as you engage your own imagination and desires, these spirits now can come and influence you in a positive direction, in a loving direction, that expands the possibility of each one of those passions and desires. So, you know, like when you're writing a song or drawing a picture or uh, planning a house and you're like you're in this optimistic desirous wow what about the possibilities well and suddenly you have this happens to you all the time doesn't it Eagle? you get this download hey you could do it this way or you could show that to people like this and and very often it's a spirit who's gone who's yeah that. <laughs> I can add to this because they're being infected and inspired by your opening and possibilities then you're opening a communication in a positive way with them. So when Fab, when Fab sang his song to us today, before we began, right, that all began through a series of passions and desires, didn't it? Basically, you started your desires, it was to have a band and be famous and be a rock star sort of type desires, and then after a while they get refined into a bit more loving-based desires and then they get refined and now you're writing songs along a certain line. And then as you activate your desires in this way, what you'll find happening is some amazing things. Like, to give you an example, these are the possibilities just to consider. At the moment, there is a, a fellow up in the, uh, up our, our way in Queensland who's decided he wants to have a divine truth radio station. But he only wants to pay music that hasn't got any copyright and who the people, who the artists, who want to give it for free. But we want to make it so that it's a worldwide uh, delivery of the service on the net. Right? Now, you imagine what might happen. You've heard nowadays, in a very short period of time, things can go what are called viral, right? <laughs> in other words, before you know it, ten days later, the world knows. Something that, that was only just created ten days earlier. And the way that happens, and my feelings are, you look at the way it happens with some of the things you've seen, some of the really pure things you've seen on the net, for example. You, you found out about them by this person going, wow, look at this, wow, look at this. And before you know it, all of your friends know, all of your family know, everybody knows, it doesn't matter who they are, they all know what's going on. And a lot of it began, if you trace it all back, many, for many of it, for much of it, it comes from the pure passion and desire of the person who did it. They didn't do it thinking, I'm going to be famous. They didn't do it thinking, I'm going to have lots of money. I'm going to have lots of offers to talk or any of those kind of things. They just did it because they wanted to do it. They activated their desire in this way, but because it was activated in this way, now it had a far greater capacity to grow. You see, God's laws are always assisting it from this perspective. And God's laws are always doing the opposite of this. So if I activate my desires in a loving way in harmony with God's laws, I've now got all of God's laws assisting me. I've got celestial spirits assisting me. I've got God agreeing with me and wanting me to go along with the whole plan, as well as little old me doing it. Now, my chances of success are much greater 
doing that than it is activating all of my fears. I've now got some very dark spirits motivating me <laughs> through my imagination. I've got some very dark spirits controlling me. I've got dark people on the earth controlling me. Now where is it going? Even if it comes to be well known, which is much less likely because it's got to work against all of God's laws to do so. But even if it becomes well known, it's still not going to create anything good. And if you think about it, the things that become well known in that way are often with the attachments of, of bribery bribe or, or blackmail. blackmail. Or a threat. People become a victim of their own success. They, they have to keep giving something or, you know, they sell out in order to get big. Mm. And so they, they've entered into something that's not pure. So my feelings are with imagination that if you use your imagination always in a loving way and always in a way that sort of motivates in a, and infects this positive direction and you will automatically gather spirit ex assistance, you will automatically have all of God's laws operating and before you know it, many of the things that you imagine have the ability to become true. But if you use your imagination in a negative way and you use your imagination just worried about threats or bribery or blackmail or attack or all of those kind of things and you focus on the fear base side of imagining the worst in other words so this is a very much well that's optimism you could say this is pessimism if like, that's desire this is other people's desires <laughs> right? you say this is infectious and then both of them have a habit of being infectious is that not true but infectious in the sense that it creates your own the, uh, destruction this one's infectious in a positive direction creates Desire, passion and so forth. In, in other words, it's inspiring. This one's inspiring? What's this? Don't you feel just drawn out and had it after having someone just project your fear at you and their imagination of what they fear even at you? Like, when you go along to discuss something with a person, do you find that when you're spending time with them and they're imagining the worst? You know, they're always talking about how hard their life is and their mortgage next week is going to be a real trouble. And You walk away feeling so drained and exhausted. And the reason why is because it is a fear-based fear -based stuff just sucks the life out of us. It sucks all the passion and desire and optimism out of us and puts it in a pessimistic state. So I'm not suggesting to ignore the fears. I'm still suggesting we need to feel them. But I'm not suggesting to live in them which is where most people use their imagination and what most people use their imagination to do. We can still live, like I live in this place where my imagination is always in a positive direction. Mary knows that. But I still have fears that I allow myself to feel. Do you follow me? And as I work through those fears, so one fear that I've had is of being attacked. And so I've had to work my way through those fears. One fear I used to have was being condescended to all the time. You know, trust me, you just say you're Jesus in front of a group of people. Instant condemnation or condescension, you know. So, oh yeah, sure. How many of you have actually had that? Oh yeah, here we go. Yep. Sure, you know. <laughs> Everyone I've met, to be frank, has had that towards me at some point. Now, I used to be terribly afraid of that, so much so that I wouldn't even say anything about who I was. Does that make sense? So just just fear, fearful all the time. So you were living on this side. So I was living here. But now I've learnt, once I learnt to feel that fear and just release that, now I could live in this place of a lot more optimism. So my viewpoint now is no. Actually, once I own up to who I am, it's actually going to be a positive thing at some point in the future, even though it might not look to be right now. Right? That's the way I see it. And can I say, just, I don't feel that I live in a loving state with my imagination yet. I've still got a lot of fears about what our life will bring to us. Um, but living with AJ, who lives in this loving space, it's very beautiful. And probably the most beautiful thing I find is the, um, the faith that he has in everyone who comes to see us, in their ability to grow in love, in their ability to connect to God. So living in this loving space of your own imagination with your own life also opens you to other people 
and how how much possibility is available to them and how you know AJ we often go oh wow you know that person's really struggling with this and AJ goes yep but you know what God's there and they're exercising their desire even if it's in a small way and there's always this faith in people's ability to change and grow and that's certainly something that has inspired me a lot and I living in this place of fear have often doubted my own ability to change and grow and um, making this shift over here to connecting to what feels like to me to be a very childlike trusting place um, is very beautiful on a lot of levels like it has a lot of other gifts apart from you connecting to your passions and desires I feel like it opens us to each other and the possibilities in each other Mm. Um, so it's very beautiful. So you don't start seeing everyone negatively anymore you know you, you feel their positive qualities. In, in, in fact, you get to the point where you can see their three selves. <laughs> you can see the self that God created them to be. You can see the injured self that they are. And you can also see the facade self. And what you do, instead of worrying about anything about fears, about all of that, what you do is each interaction with them, you're trying to focus them either on their injured self or on their real self. And you're trying to help them to release or release their attachment to their facade self. And that is the most thing that inspires me most to make this shift to the loving imagination because that to me is the most loving way I can interact with anyone around me to focus them on the truth of who they are as God's, God's child or the truth of what's injured within them in order to help them grow. So I feel that it creates an opportunity in every interaction to love and it creates an opportunity for the person you're interacting with to grow. Um, So it's very beautiful, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I feel very optimistic. (laughs) So do our guides. (laughs) Sometimes when I'm in the fear place, I go off and do a channeling and I come out and I go, yeah, they're they're happy happy. again. (laughs) It's all going to be all right. (laughs) When we we did the Channel 7 interviews... um, that all got cancelled. Before they got cancelled, Mary's going, I don't know if I want these Channel 7 interviews to go to air. And they're like, I think I'll channel about that. <laughs> you know, so he runs off and does some channeling, some automatic writing about it and comes back saying, yeah, they're happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. No one will commiserate with my fear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, uh, and that's how it is. Like every, every person who, the closer you get to God, the more optimistic you become automatically. And you and see the opportunity to... In everything. In everything. And, and that was something that took me through that interview process, mm-hmm. trying to give people around me the opportunity to act in love. Yeah. Now, they didn't really take it, but <laughs> I gave myself the opportunity through that process to be authentic and that, that made it worthwhile for me. Yeah. 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 Do you guys feel like a break? Yep. yep. So let's have one, shall we?